Touchdown! 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 The Bills make me wanna shout. Kick your heels up and shout. Throw your hands up and shout. Throw your head back and shout. Come on now, the Bills are making it happen now. Stand up now, come on and shout. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say shout it right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Buffalo Fanatics Podcast. I am your host, Fern Bannatine, as always. And we are one week into the beginning of training camp. We have a lot of news to catch up on. Unlike most of July when most of the news cycle was slow concerning the Buffalo Bills, uh, we are now starting the month of August. Preseason is right around the corner and training camp's underway. I'm sure most of you Bills fanatics and Bills mafia have been keeping a close eye on the goings-on there so far this week. And we're going to give you a little bit of a review today of the first week of training camp. I thought I'd take a little bit of a spin off the uh, the Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. But rather than being uh, so pessimistic, we're going to have two two good categories. So I'm going to call this show The Beautiful, The Good, and The Bad. And go over, categorize the events and the players and training camps that have been A, beautiful, uh, B, good, and C, uh, we're going to talk about the bad as well. Now, obviously, we're only one week into training camp, so we do have to take these early events with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, But I think we're starting to see a few stories develop. Uh, Generally, there's a lot of positive occurrences to start getting excited about, but there's a few causes for concern as well. I think notably the Mitch Morris and the concussion protocol uh, definitely raises some early alarm bells, but uh, let's talk about some of the good occurrences before we get into that. And we're going to start with the even better than good category, the beautiful, the things that we've seen so far after one week that have exceeded expectations. And I wanted to start with just uh, an an overarching observation that I've had so far, uh, just from the reports that I've heard in training camp. And it's really the general camaraderie that we've seen so far amongst the team and the coaching staff. There seems to be a general feeling of positivity in the air that the Bills players are really meshing well and Bills coaching staff. And of course, the owners, Terry and Kim Pagula, are all really on board with each other. Now, there's no more positive time in the year, no more optimistic time of the year in any uh, NFL training camp than this time of the year. Uh, I'm sure if you pulled any fan base, they would all uh, feel generally optimistic about their team as well. But I do really believe that there's uh, tangible, concrete reasons why we should be uh, just a little more excited and optimistic this year. And that the team kind of feels this way as well. I think it starts with the continuity with now Sean McDermott uh, firmly entrenched as our coach. I think he's built a level of trust with the players that have been on this roster. Uh, Lots of free agent acquisitions, which is pretty exciting to have all these new players in camp. I think the fact that we have some uh, stability, at least at quarterback, and some excitement in a guy who I think the team gets to watch a little grow from his infancy into a leader and a potential franchise quarterback. Uh, We see the optimism amongst the fan base, and I think that rubs off a little bit on the players as well. Now, it also seems uh, with this coaching staff, uh, there's more of an air of urgency or an air of professionalism out there. Of course, maybe I just wasn't paying as much attention as I am this year in previous years. But I do see the coaching staff implementing some new little wrinkles that I hadn't really noticed before. The coaches are very hands-on and with the players. Bobby Johnson stands out as one guy, the offensive line coach. He's got a very loud and recognizable voice. And we've been hearing about the level of precision employed in these training camp practices. By the second day, they were already using headsets and down and distance markers. And that's something that we haven't seen with uh, previous administrations, previous coaching staffs, as early in their training camps. Another positive sign that I've taken note of is the offensive game calling. The level of different formations and player personnel groupings. It does seem like very early on that Brian Dable is starting to get a little more creative with that offense. That's always kind of been what he's known for over his career. So perhaps having a few more weapons out there and a little more experience. And of course, the quarterback who's a little more prepared, fully entrenched early on as a starter. Rather than last year where it was a bit of a piecemeal group for the first few months of the season. So yeah, I'm really excited to see uh, what Dable does with this offense. Uh, We definitely have a lot of speed players on offense and... If he can get creative and get those guys in open space, there could be an an exciting new element to the offense going into the season. And speaking of dynamic speed players and those players that can provide us with big chunk plays, I would say the most beautiful player at training camp so far has been wide receiver John Brown, the free agent acquisition out of Baltimore. 
You've probably heard about John Brown's success at training camp so far, if you've been following any of the reports from camp. But he has meshed extremely well very early on with Josh Allen. He seems rather uncoverable out there to this point. He's demonstrating that he's a very sophisticated route runner. He's great at tracking the ball over his shoulders. He's really a, a more sophisticated version or a more advanced version of Robert Foster at this point. And he's relegated Robert Foster to number two team duties, which gives us some exciting depth on the wide receiver core. To have a player like Foster, who I've called a very good breakout candidate on a previous podcast, to have him relegated to number two because John Brown's been so excellent is one of those good problems to have. Now, of course, the issue with John Brown has never been his competency out there. It's been his injuries. So we'll have to keep a close eye on that. But if we can get him here playing a full season in this offense with Brian Dable's creative tweaks and with Josh Allen's cannon of an arm, that could be a pretty exciting development going into the season. So John Brown's been the most beautiful player so far in training camp. But moving on, another player who's been one of the stars of training camp is our third round pick, running back Devin Singletary. If you watched him in college or any highlights from college, you saw all the jukes and jump cuts that he was able to do. You see a lot of a young LaShawn McCoy out there. And, you know, you were just hoping to see if it translates to the NFL level. And uh, one week into training camp, he has not disappointed. He looks like your classic slash runner out there. He's also shown that he can catch the ball too. He's already gotten plenty involved in the passing game and he's looked natural doing it. That's good to see because we saw we didn't see much of that in college. We only got 51 balls over three seasons, only six receptions his last season. So if he, he continues to demonstrate that skill, then he's going to get a lot more playing time than we probably anticipate at this point. And who knows what happens with our other two veteran running backs if we do want to get Devin Singletary on the field a little more. So that, that will be an interesting development to watch to see if Singletary's progression means it's the end of the LaShawn McCoy era in Buffalo. Uh, another player I really wanted to highlight as beautiful is cornerback Kevin Johnson. Now, uh, if you recall in the last podcast, I actually discussed Johnson as a potential cut candidate, uh, just given our cornerback death and given all the injury concerns with him and EJ Gaines over the last few years. But he has really stood out at the cornerback position. Sean McDermott's already gone out of his way to praise Johnson and saying that he's been impressed with him. On Sunday, day four of training camp, they were using Kevin Johnson around to see to test his versatility inside and outside. That will be an interesting development to watch considering that Johnson's primarily been an outside corner most of his career. He's already been getting a lot of first team reps. So uh, I think I talked about last week how Johnson can either be uh, a guy that gets cut or a guy that ends up being a starting cornerback for this team. Uh, early on, starting to look like he does have a good shot at making this team. On Tuesday's press conference with Leslie Fraser, I found it a little uh, little odd. I don't know what his strategy is, but he uh, did announce that he expects Levi Wallace to uh, retain the starting job opposite Trevidavious White. I don't know if that was maybe a technique to motivate guys like Kevin Johnson and EJ Gaines, or maybe his strategy was to uh, allow Levi Wallace to kind of relax a little bit and just do what he does best out there rather than, than looking over his shoulder at the next guy up. But either way, I, I don't know if I take it at c- complete face value. I will say Levi Wallace is probably the favorite to start. Uh, but regardless, uh, Kevin Johnson getting these reps uh, inside and out uh, bodes well for his potential spot on this roster. And he's a guy I really wanted to point out here because the coaching staff has raved about him. And a lot of accounts have noted that Johnson's played really well so far in training camp. That'll be a fun position battle to watch. And uh, our death at cornerback is one of the strong points of this team. So one last item that I think is uh, fairly beautiful uh, would be the continuity that we have already at at the left guard position. Uh, Quinton Spain's taken almost every first team snap at the position. And I think it fits in the beautiful category because I think continuity along the offensive line is just such a valuable thing to have in this league. And I was a little concerned going into the season with all the new players that we have in there, all those free agent signings that we made and bringing in Cody Ford in the draft, that it was going to take a while for this unit to gel. And I'm not the biggest fan of this, all this maneuvering and shifting around on the offensive line. I know Sean McDermott's trying a lot of different combinations just to see kind of what works and where players would fit best to help the team. 
He definitely wants to see which guys could have a, a feasible shot at being a backup center. He's moving John Feliciano in there. Spencer Long has been playing some snaps at center as well. But I do like the fact that uh, at least Spain is firmly entrenched in that left guard position and he can grow uh, beside Deion Dawkins and Mitch Morse, uh, provided he gets back on the field to really solidify that left side of the line with three players, let them get familiar with each other, get to know each other, and they can learn uh, where they move and how, how they position themselves. And that's really key for an offensive line. What you see across the league when you have a continuity along offensive lines, uh, they generally only improve over time. In fact, we saw that on our team a few years back when we had the combination of uh, Cordy Glenn, Richie Incognito, and Eric Wood on that left side of the line, and it really led to some of the best rushing attacks in the league. So I'm glad to see a, a commitment to get uh, Spain in there as our starter. Uh, and I haven't really been able to see or, or at least hear about how he's been playing so far, but if he is continually getting the first team reps, obviously the coaching staff likes him to be our starter going into the season, most likely, of course. All right, we're going to move into the good category now, next to the beautiful. And here is where we're going to start with quarterback Josh Allen. It's a very different situation in here in his second year compared to his first year where he's firmly entrenched as a starter, where he got his feet wet last year and continuously showed improvement. And that has really transferred over into training camp this year. Uh, by almost all accounts, he looks like a much more confident guy out there, You're really starting to demonstrate some leadership qu qualities. Uh, many veterans have commented how he uh, shows much greater command in the pocket than last year. Uh, he seems to have shown immediate chemistry with John Brown. I think the chemistry with Cole Beasley is starting to develop too. It's going to take a little longer, of course, because Beasley really excels on those shorter intermediate routes, which is probably where Josh Allen has the most room to grow. It does seem like both guys are starting to get along and uh, they may be forging a little bit of a friendship there. So that's always a good sign uh, when you have a good relationship between wide receiver and quarterback. And uh, I didn't elevate him to the beautiful category because he has uh, demonstrated a bit of inconsistency. He's had some good days and uh, some not so good days. And mostly it's just his inconsistency with his accuracy that's his issue. And that's probably not something too surprising to any of us. We know that in college and throughout his first year, he did struggle in that area. Uh, but overall, it's mostly positive signs from Josh Allen uh, with these two new receivers, Brown and Cole Beasley, and the chemistry that they're developing being uh, the biggest positive development. And all we can hope is that they continue to progress together. And Allen, with continuous reps and more experience, uh, just starts to get a little more consistent. Uh, but all signs are still on par for Allen, really, uh, to continue to progress in his second season. And uh, week one from training camp has not uh, changed that optimistic outlook. Uh, another guy I wanted to highlight in the good category is wide receiver Ray Ray McLeod. Uh, the coaching staff has really stuck with him. Uh, through his first year when he did have his struggles or couldn't really get get much playing time. Uh, many people have commented that he's had a really good camp so far. Brian Dable went out of his way to mention McLeod as somebody who's improved over the course of his first season into his second season. Now it looks like if we do keep six receivers, uh, five spots are already locked up with John Brown, Zay Jones, Cole Beasley, Robert Foster, and Andre Roberts because of his special teams prowess. So that only really leaves one spot for the likes of McLeod, Isaiah McKenzie, your Duke Williams, your Cam Phillips, your Victor Boldens, and a few others all battling for a potential only one additional spot. Now the thing with McLeod, and you, you kind of figure that that last spot is going to go to a wide receiver who can play special teams as well and that really wasn't his forte in his first year he didn't play many snaps at special teams where guys like Isaiah McKenzie uh, did play a lot of snaps on special teams so he's still going to have that going for him uh, he is practice squad eligible so that might be another potential landing spot if he does not make the team uh, but definitely the coaching staff is sticking with him and the fact that they've gone out of their way to say good things and other people have observed that he's having a good camp as well. I did think he does deserve a mention here and he's a guy to keep our eye on as training camp goes on and the preseason goes on. Let's see if he can be the guy that secures that final wide receiver spot if they only do keep six receivers. Now moving on, I think uh, Senior East Perry, the running back, is a guy that also deserves a mention 
It looks like he's already playing ahead of uh, TJ Yeldon on the death chart. Uh, we know he was brought in because he is a good special teams player. Uh, so far in camp, he's been a significant member of the special teams first team. And when he did get some action with the offense on uh, training camp day four, uh, he made a nice catch on a sideline throw that drew some raves from all in attendance. So even though we do have a pretty deep running back core right now, uh, depending on how things shake out at the top in terms of player transactions, uh, we expect Frank Gore, LaShawn McCoy, and Devin Singletary all to make the team. Uh, but that fourth spot looks like uh, after the first week that it's Perry's uh, Perry's spot to lose, uh, just given his special teams prowess and given that he's already playing ahead of TJ Yeldon. Now, before moving on, I want to give a shout out to another few guys who, by most accounts in the written media, uh, on Twitter, and other people who have been able to observe camp have mentioned are having good camps. And we start with the starting running back, LaShawn McCoy. He does look like he could be able to regain his old form. He's been playing with the ones and he's had some pretty nice runs. Looks good out there. Uh, defensive end Trent Murphy has had some pretty nice reps. Uh, he's beaten Cody Ford around the corner a few times. He looks like he's a little more explosive this year from early accounts. In his press conference on Tuesday, Leslie Fraser went out of his way to mention uh, Trent Murphy looking a little better this year. That's a really good sign if we can get another defensive end to be productive. We talked about this quite quite a little bit about how Jerry Hughes needs a partner out there to alleviate some of the pressure on him and maybe... Having someone that can close from other angles will really help Jerry Hughes' sack production. So it'd be a really good sign if Trent Murphy does improve from the average uh, statistical output he's put out the last few seasons and he can get back to that one season in Washington when he had nine sacks. Another guy I wanted to mention uh, is linebacker, uh, a deaf linebacker, and that's Corey Thompson, who was getting some first-team reps late in training camp week one. Uh, it seems the Bills... Uh, Brash really likes his uh, coverage ability. They've been th throwing him out there in nickel situations. He's been working quite a bit with Lorenzo Alexander to hone his skills. Uh, so this could be a young player that's uh, showing, demonstrating a little bit of development, and it really increases his chance to make the team. If he did make the team, he'd probably be the backup strong side linebacker behind Lorenzo Alexander, which is an area where uh, he could get a lot of play, just given Alexander's age. Uh, everybody's looking for coverage linebackers these days, so if he can show that he can keep up with the running backs and tight ends, that'll go a long way for him to actually get playing time during the season if he does make the team. So let, let's hope this continues to progress. Maybe the game's just starting to slow down for him, and uh, maybe he can develop into somebody who not only makes the team but gets some playing time. These are the kind of players that I really like to keep my eye on this time of the year just to see who does have potential out there to develop and find a role or carve out a role on this team uh, so let's keep watching Corey Thompson's development over the next few weeks all right so let's move into the the bad category now we won't say ugly but we'll just say the bad uh, things that we've seen so far that even one week into training camp might be cause for concern and it all starts with the injuries really uh, we start with our prized free agent acquisition and center Mick Schmorse we learned on Wednesday that he was going to sit out of practice uh, after suffering a concussion and uh, getting placed in the concussion protocol. Uh, we haven't really been provided with too many details as of yet, as of this recording. Uh, this is obviously concerning. Concussions are always concerning, uh, but specifically for Morse, who's had at least three concussions previously in his career. I believe he had two concussions his rookie season, and then last year he missed some time with another concussion. Uh, we obviously first and foremost hope for his well-being, uh, but the impact it could have on the team as well. Uh, we went out and made this guy the highest paid center in the league, and, and we really anticipate him being a difference maker and helping with the development of our second-year quarterback. Uh, he's been a stalwart center throughout his career when he has been healthy, uh, probably the best pass-blocking center in the league. I believe he has some astronomical uh, streak going where he hasn't allowed a sack in over uh, 1,500 snaps or something ridiculous like that. So this is definitely a cause for concern, just the seriousness of the uh, concussion issues and the value he's expected to bring to this team as the, the anchor for his newly assembled offensive line and our young quarterback. Uh, so this is going to be a, a concerning development that's worth monitoring. Now, aside from Mitch Morse, there is more injury news that is concerning as well, and that's at the tight end position. We already know that we had Tyler Croft on the physically unable to perform list. Now we have... 
both Jason Kroom and Dawson Knox, who have missed some time during training camp with hamstring injuries. Uh, we know that those injuries can sometimes be a little bit nagging, so that's worth monitoring. And it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of these guys aren't getting the reps that they probably need. All of them probably need to further their development, especially the guys that are new to this offense, get a little rapport going with Josh Allen. So it's going to look like we're going to be a little thin at the tight end position uh, in training camp and potentially early into the season. Uh, this has given an opportunity for a young seventh round draft pick Tommy Sweetie to get some significant playing time. Haven't heard much positive or negative yet. Uh, just that he's just been a guy out there, but let's keep a close eye on him and to see if he does start to develop and uh, show some flashes. That could be a, a good thing that comes out of all of these injuries. Not surprisingly, the Bills signed a tight end uh, early in the week. Uh, Kyle Carter, a former Penn State Nittany Lion who seems to have some pretty good physical measurables. Uh, he's probably more of a just a camp body to get another guy in there to fulfill some playing time while all these guys uh, rest up from their injuries. But suffice to say, the guys that are playing out there right now are probably not going to be guys that get playing time once the regular season starts. And I think it's an easy assessment to say that the tight end position, which was already not a strong point of this team, is the position of most concern, at least after the first week of training camp. Uh, another area where I wanted to talk about was one player, right tackle Cody Ford, the youngster. Uh, he's had his struggles early on in training camp. It looks like he's been beat to the outside a few times. Uh, there's been talk about Trent Murphy already. We discussed him beating him around the corner. Uh, Daryl Johnson, this rookie seventh-round draft pick, had a few good reps against Ford. There's been speculation that it may be time to try him inside at guard, but the coaching staff, has, uh, rightly so, has remained committed to leave Cody Ford out of tackle, and I think that's probably the best thing to do. Uh, let him continue to develop. We're only a week into training camp so far, and if he can develop as a tackle, I think that's a much more a valuable position than guard even though he probably can be a dominant guard in this league uh, let's continue to be patient and see if we can find a tackle but just because of the importance and the scarcity of tackles in this league it, i think it's just a bit too early to pull the plug on the cody ford at tackle experiments you know, he doesn't necessarily have to win the starting job we're not in a terrible situation if he doesn't we still have tyne yuseki deon dawkins and maybe even like adrian waddle who can play the tackle position at a decent level they've demonstrated so let's just hope that uh, Ford continues to develop and he does start to show a little bit more at the tackle position. Uh, the next position that I wanted to talk about it's not so bad so far but he's definitely been a little inconsistent and that's Ed Oliver. I'd really be remiss if I didn't mention him. Uh, it looks like he's been kind of swallowed up and engulfed so far on some reps. Now I will mention that it's always difficult for defensive tackles to make the transition from college into the NFL just because of the strength requirements in the league. Uh, but you do expect your your ninth pick overall and a guy who was such a dominant college player, you, you expect him to come in and just continue that dominance in, at the pro level. And so far he's had a struggle. So he had, has had some decent flashes as well. He has shown that speed and closing ability element. Uh, but we have to be critical when it, when it warrants at times. And uh, so far Ed Oliver hasn't really dominated as... Uh, I don't know if we would have expected that to happen, but I guess we hoped that it would come in and immediately dominate. Uh, both with Ed Oliver and Cody Ford, I will mention that both positions are very hard to make the transition to the NFL level, not just the defensive tackle, but the offensive tackle too. Uh, so let's see if the game starts slowing down for these players and if they can start learning and growing as players uh, throughout training camp and hopefully lock down uh, starting positions for this team. That's probably best case scenario. And lastly, I wanted to mention, uh, back to the offense and the wide receiver position, uh, we already spoke a little bit about how there's not much room for wide receivers outside of the top guys to make the team, uh, but a guy we've talked quite a bit about on this podcast, uh, optimistically, is Duke Williams, uh, just because of the size that he brings to the field. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like he's getting uh, many significant repetitions, and not with the first or second team not getting, getting many special teams snaps and that was really going to have to be his calling card to some extent uh, he was definitely going to have to play special teams if he does have a chance to make this team uh, and I think the writing is on the wall so far unless things really may take a significant uh, move forward that Williams is going to be a very far long shot to make this roster it is interesting to note that both Isaiah McKenzie and Ray Ray McLeod are very small guys and they're getting more uh, repetitions in that gunner role at least uh, in some snaps 
you wonder sometimes if guys that small can withstand that role. But so far, uh, we haven't seen Duke Williams out there. Another guy, another wide receiver who seems to have had his struggles early in training camp is David Sills. Uh, I talked a little bit about him on last week's podcast as a guy who uh, had a significant spotlight shined on him in the Embedded series, but he hasn't really made any plays out there. He's looked a bit underdeveloped physically. I don't haven't heard, at least, that he's getting any special teams reps, so I think he's a bit of a long shot to make the roster as well. He certainly could be an ideal practice squad candidate, uh, but I think both, uh, at this point, Duke Williams and David Sills have to be considered long shots to make the team at the wide receiver position. All right, so that is it. That is the beautiful, the good, and the bad. After week one of Buffalo Bills training camp, I think overall, like I mentioned earlier, just the feeling at training camp, how things are progressing out there, I'm much more positive than I am negative. Uh, the most important development, of course, we talk about this quite often, is the development of Josh Allen. And that looks good so far, outside of, of course, those in- inconsistencies with his accuracy. So things are really on track, and we're going to continue to uh, bring you as much coverage across the Buffalo Fanatics platforms and different podcasts that we have, uh, bring you as much coverage as we can of training camp and what we think of what's going on. And I'll be back next week to discuss training camp and any new developments in greater detail. So Until next week, go Buffalo Bills!